as uh, Felicity was saying, my name's my Bush. So we, I live in here in Charlton Kings on Charlton Drive. We moved here back in 96, myself, my wife, Vicky, and our two children. Our two children went to local school, Balcaris. Um, Vicky taught at the local university. And I worked for a, a local software house as a project manager. And you know, so far, everything was normal. But back in 2006, as you're very much aware, Cheltenham's really good for festivals. And one thing they run in the June is they, they run a science festival. And there was an event that June in 2006 where the then chief scientific officer, Sir David King, gave a talk on climate change. And it wasn't we were particularly interested in climate change or had a great need to know about climate change. You know, we, we knew climate change was happening, but we booked the event and we went along to it and actually was pretty, pretty big in changing both myself and Vicky's um, approach to climate after that. So it, just to take you back, I mean, everyone seems to know, we used to call it global warming in those days. And if you remember back in 1990, in our own, oh dear, there you go. The closet eco warrior, Margaret Thatcher, she said back in 1990, the danger of global warming is as yet unseen, but real enough for us to make changes and sacrifices so that we do not live at the expense of future generations. And also, everyone will remember back in 92, in two years after that, at the Earth Summit in Rio, all the world's leaders got together and said, climate change is a real problem. We need to have a sustainable future. And Agenda 21 came out of it. And everyone decided, yeah, we're going to do something about this. So that was back in, in 92. So forward 14 years to uh, 2006, you, know, the, you have the situation that we went to this talk. The talk was given by the then Chief Scientific Officer, Sir David King. So he, he gave the talk, he sort of explained the climate change. He went through the history of it. He sort of told you about how the science of it was established way back in the 19th century. How French ma mathematician sort of calculated that there must be a, a warming effect because otherwise the amount of energy coming in from the sun couldn't keep the earth as, wa as warm as it was. The Irish uh, scientist Tyndall, he actually did the work to sort of establish what the greenhouse gases were. So he established that carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and water vapour and other things were causing the planet to warm up. And it wasn't a bad thing, actually, because if we didn't have the warming effect of the greenhouse gases, it, the Earth would be uninhabitable for humans. But, you know, that's that's where it was it was good. Then he then started to talk about the things we're going to need to do just in terms of adaptation. And the adaptation was you know, it's horrific because he just went through the whole globe showed all these areas which were sort of very close to sea level at the moment and the sea levels rose they would be flooded out there would be problems that uh, these areas are getting warmer and warmer they would not be able to support uh, food production so you'd have to have mass emigrations of areas and that wasn't that was just adaptation on the basis that the climate was going to keep on going warmer and warmer and warmer as we pumped out all these greenhouse gases what i wasn't aware of was he, he talked about positive feedbacks. Now, positive feedback to me is someone to say, well, oh, that was a good talk, Mike, I enjoyed it. But in science terms, a positive feedback is an amplifying effect. So for example, in Siberia, you have all this methane frozen in the, piece, in the permafrost. So as you have warming, the permafrost melts, the methane re is released, Methane is a much more powerful greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide, and that causes more warming. And as they get more warming, more permafrost melts, and as more permafrost melts, more methane escapes. So you get this positive feedback loop, which just gets warmer and warmer and warmer. And so another thing that he mentioned, was, uh, which, which is very worrying for an elderly male, was the albedo, loss of albedo. So the albedo um, is, effect is basically you actually have a big shiny area in the north pole and that reflects a lot of the sun's energy out into space 
what was happening with the warming is that the then you get exposing more dark areas dark areas absorb more of the sun's energy causing more warming causing more ice to shrink causing and so these positive um, uh, feedback uh, these positive feedback loops just meant that you could actually have a very dangerous runaway uh, runway uh, runaway uh, climate so probably not seen since the the, the time of the younger dryas when the actual climate rose about 10 degrees so there's some debate it's whether three years or 10 years but a massively short period for a massive um, uh, rise in temperature so this actually sort of caused great alarmism to me because you're just thinking well yeah what you're talking about is just the gradual raising of the temperature will actually mean yes okay things will get hotter but it's a slow thing if you actually had uh, run runaway uh, climate change it is actually you know, far far more serious than that you know there, there was no doubt about it you know something had to be done and i was thinking well so i came away from that talk and i thought about uh, well actually as we walked away from the town hall it's held in the town hall and it, it was interesting because it was one of those events where uh, I don't know if you've been to them, but they actually give you these controls like, like you have in you know, Who Wants to Be a Millionaire? And at the beginning of the talk, Sir David King said, you know, who knows about climate change? Who thinks it's serious? And so on. And so you had all these people pressing their ABCDs and you're seeing on the screen what they what people thought. And his final question when he left was, how many people think it's serious? And almost unanimously, everyone in that room thought it was serious. I mean, one of whom was actually um, our MP at the time, Martin Horwood. And I always wonder whether you know, going to that talk impacted him because he actually was really a, a great person in terms of demanding higher limits for the, you know, with, they were talking about 50%. He said, no, we've got to make it 80% and so on in terms of carbon reduction. So, but you leaving there, you, you, you know, I thought of the Woody Allen quote, you know, you know, more than any other time in history, mankind faces the crossroads. One path leads to despair and utter hopelessness, the other to total extinction. Let us pray we have the wisdom to choose correctly. And he, it, it was, I was pretty bleak, but something else happened that year. And that was that um, I went on a permaculture design course. So I don't know how many of you have heard about permaculture. So it's a portmanteau word meaning permanent culture, permanent agriculture. And the, the principles of it were formulated by a guy called Bill Mollinson and his PhD student, David Holmgren. And it's all, all about how. Uh, live more lightly on the planet, how you can actually uh, adapt to climate change, how you can actually mitigate climate change and other things such as the uh, peak oil and shortages or, or not just shortages, we can't afford to burn fossil, uh, fossil fuels anymore. So that was very inspirational to me. So in, in one sense in that year I had two things, you know, I had the, the wake up call from, from, Sir, um, from Sir David but I also smelled the coffee when I went on the permaculture course. So that made uh, myself and Vicky sort of do all sorts of things to change our life and change the way our house was run. And I actually carried out a design for Grossmont. So you'll keep on hearing this reference to Grossmont. Grossmont is the name of the house we live on. We live on this uh, little um, drive called Charlton Drive where uh, apart from two houses, everyone's chosen to have a name for the house. So. Uh, I prefer numbers, but that's a different issue. And it's it's called Grossmont, not Gromont. I'm from the north. I thought it to be called Gromont from the, the place in um, in Yorkshire, but it's not. It's Grossmont from the village in the borders. So what I'll be talking about is the, the, the plans and things we did for Grossmont. And so, but before then, where were we? In two, so what I did was, I uh, this is a carbon footprint of Grossmont in the year 2000. So you can establish your footprint very, very easily nowadays. There's lots and lots of tools on the um, on the internet. The The way I did it in those days is that um, I'm pretty obsessional about recording things like energy bills and uh, recording everything, all costs spent and litres of petrol consumed and so on. So you can actually get conversion factors. So you can calculate your emissions from that. So for the purposes of this talk, I was only going to consider four things. That's uh, for a household. That's electricity, 
gas, travel, and flights. So the reason I've chosen that is they're easily measurable. So I could actually evidence to anybody to say that exactly was the carbon footprint for those four things. I mean, everything, there's lots of other things which cause um, carbon emissions. So the things that uh, yeah, food, clothing, and just stuff in general. And we, we made lots of changes in those areas as well. But for the, for the purposes of this talk, just well, let's just consider those four things. So, and also the unit I'm going to be talking about is the CO2 equivalent, tons CO2 equivalent. In fact, I'll be a lot more sloppy than that. I'll just talk about carbon and carbon emissions. But when I'm saying carbon, I'm meaning CO2 equivalent because greenhouse gases aren't just carbon dioxide. There's other greenhouse gases as well. And for anything that you do, they can they can, can compute a sort of measure to sort of say, okay, it might be giving off NOx, it might be giving off CO2, it might be giving off methane. So, but the CO2 equivalent is this. So it's a bit like you coming back from holiday with your Swiss francs, your euros, and your sterling, and you say, oh, I came back from my holiday with only four pounds sterling equivalent, as opposed to have to enumerate all the different currencies. So, Rosemont, the place where the Bush family lived, 1930s detached house in Charlton Kings. And in two, year 2000, we consumed 30,222 kilowatt hours of gas, of which 7,290 kilowatt hours was for hot water and cooking. So you can see from that, the vast majority is space, space heating. 5,102 kilowatt hours of electricity. I told you I, was, I do attend to all the detail here, but I'm going to simplify things. And 2,444 litres of petrol and took 13 flights. Right. So let's convert all that to CO2 equivalent. That meant the Grossmont household in the year 2000 had 18 tonnes of carbon. At the time, the UK average would have been 50%, sorry, for, for those four measures, would have been 12 tonnes. So we were 50% more than the, the UK average at that time. The, the other things you can see from there, which is, again, it's just very interesting to note, the, the how much is flights and it just, it just stands out so much that over over four tons was just on flights transport so that's we didn't do much public transport in those days so that's all down to petrol for our cars electricity is what it is gas we had gas central heating and gas water heating so we chose a target of getting down to a Per, uh, one ton per person. That that came about. There was, a, there was a local activist, a woman called Kathy Green. So that's a nominative determinism for you. She ran a carbon reduction action group at the time called the One Tonners. And so we thought, well, that's a good thing. We'll go for one ton as well. And then looking at the analysis of where we were, we thought, well, the obvious thing to do is we won't fly anymore. Not get rid of a load. Uh, I gave up uh, my job as the at the local software house and became a worker for the local sustainability charity, Vision 21, and cycled to work. Vicky already cycled to work, but she didn't attend any conferences and things like that. So I thought, ah, oh, that's great. This is easy stuff, this carbon reduction stuff. The other thing is when you look to the electricity, although it wasn't as much in terms of the carbon, um, it was only two tons for the electricity. And so gas was a lot more with their six tons. The fact is that back then, electricity, the emissions were three times higher. So for a kilowatt hour of, um, of, of electricity, you would have three times the emissions than you would have for a kilowatt hour of gas. So one of the things we first of all did was we said, okay, let's change all our lamps, make sure they're all low energy lamps. It's a dead easy win. Nowadays, this, you know, this wouldn't be applicable because probably people haven't got any of the old lamps in their house and back then it was quite difficult because some of the lamps are a bit difficult to get a low energy uh, alternative now 
and everything is so so straightforward. Uh, the other thing then, so we've got four and a half tons is for, of the gas is for space heating. Space heating, which just means keeping you warm, the, the central heating radiators and everything. So what the first thing we did was we thought, right, we've got to improve the thermal envelope. We've got a disadvantage. We're starting off with a 1930s house. It's obviously not going to be as thermally efficient as a modern house. But the 1930s uh, the house, the previous owners had already insulated the cavity walls. So that was a good start. What they hadn't done was that the, the um, loft insulation was only up to the joist. So we topped that up and we got loads and loads of insulation in there. The other thing is that the original windows in Grossmont, so in the 30s, there were uh, steel windows with, uh, with glass panels, single glazed, and they had a, a U value of about 5.2. Now, when you come across sort of um, anything to do with the building control and sort of the energy efficiency properties of building, they talk about something called a U value. So basically, all you need to know is that you've got to make a U value as low as possible. So a U value of 5.2 is actually terrible. The current building standard, the current Part L regulations for windows says, if you're going to put in um, windows, they've got to have a U value of 1.4. Now, at the time when we came to replace our windows, we put in triple glazed windows. The, 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 the glazing units are filled with argon. They have low emissivity reflective coatings on one side, and the U value is actually 0.9. So we've gone from a U value of 5.2 to a U value of, of 0.9. Now, interestingly, they, as I say, the, the current regulations is still 1.4. But at the time, if we just wanted to go, on, to go on ahead and replace the windows, we could have done, and Part L allowed a U value of 2 at the time. So we could have replaced them, it would have been far more efficient, but we just decided, okay, when you're going to, when we're doing something, we will just go that bit further. And that, that's always something I always sort of say to somebody, if you're going to do any sort of serious building work on your house or any improvements, just consider just going that bit further, because generally it will be more expensive. But if you consider the whole life cycle, is it going to work out cheaper? So going back to the four and a half tons for the space heating. So what we put in was we put in two wood burning stoves. Now um, that supplies all our space heating. We don't switch on the central heating. So we still have a gas boiler, but we just, that doesn't come on until nine o'clock at night. And it's only on for an hour and a half and it's on for an hour in the morning. Otherwise all our space heating during the day and in the evening up to nine o'clock, we'll be using uh, these wood burning stoves in the dining room kitchen area and the uh, lounge now it might be a bit surprising to some people to sort of realize to think well wait a minute how does that save carbon if you're using uh, burning wood because that is just pure carbon the, i mean the reason it's considered carbon neutral is because the idea is that you're burning a, a source that is actually uh, replenished so all the time it's in a constant balance so if you give you an example at the bottom of our garden we plant hazel the hazel we coppice on a short term coppice rotation and then go to making bean poles and pea sticks. When those bean poles and pea sticks are too brittle because they've actually uh, dried out so much, we then just burn them in our wood burning stove. But at the same time, all the hazel's grown back from the coppicing. So it's that principle sort of um, made larger because we, we were getting a lot of wood from our friend's wood and also from a local supplier. So it's considered carbon neutral because although, yes, it's pure carbon, it is actually a short period and then you're always keeping things in balance. But even so, I've got this under improve the thermal envelope. Before the wood burning stoves were put in, these fires had um, gas open flame effect fires. So basically, you know, the, all, most of the energy from the gas would go straight up. But even if you weren't having the, the gas fires on, it's an energy sink. So energy, hot energy escapes up the flues. So by actually blocking up the flues, you make it, you improve the thermal envelope anyway. So the water, one and a half tons of carbon for producing hot water. 
So one of the things we thought we'd do is, okay, we'll get solar thermal water. Uh, this is very simple. When we lived in Nigeria, this, uh, people used to put on hot water tanks on top of their bungalow and paint it black on the outside. And that would just cause lots and lots of hot water. I mean, there was a problem of getting water in the tank in the first place. But apart from that, if they had water, it would have got very hot. This is a, a similar sort of principle. The sun is going to heat up these tubes. And at the tips of these tubes, there's a, a, a fluid. And when that gets five degrees above the temperature in the bottom of the tank, a pump comes in and circulates the water, heat exchanges until they equalize, and then switches off the pump. And then these will heat up the fluid again. So it's a very efficient way for the size of area to give you hot water. The other thing we did, obviously, was photovoltaics. So two tons of our emissions was electricity. So we thought, why not be a micro generator? Let's produce our own electricity. So you can see a couple of things here as we're looking. So this is Grossmont with the old conservatory and also the old windows. And we put on four kilowatt peak of electric, uh, PV photovoltaics and there you can see these solar thermal collectors. When we have the passive solar extension built, we put more PV on top of the, that roof. And you can also see the triple glaze windows and doors. But one of the things about uh, PV, photovoltaics, is that people don't realize that um, even quite a lot of people have got them. If there's actually an outage, it could be a sunny day, a very sunny day, and there's an outage, you won't actually get any electricity. So this could be generating five kilowatts of electricity. And if the grid is down, you won't get a single bit. So what we put in place was a battery backup system. And the battery backup system means that uh, if there is a grid outage and it's a sunny day, you can still keep on um, still keep on generating. But more than that, the the what you also get is you get the actual it, it stores energy for you. So the way it works is that if you were generating more than the household needs, the extra energy is stored in the, these Tesla batteries. And when the Tesla batteries are full, if we're still generating more than the household needs, then this power flow unit here kicks in and dumps any surplus energy into the hot water tank and to the towel rail in the, in the bathroom. And it's only when this is full and when all the, all the hot water we need and the towels are all dry, it's only then do we export. But more importantly, because I, I again, this is the idea of introducing resilience into the design for Grossmont, if there is any power outage or at night time, then we just run off these batteries here. So to give you an example of how effective that is, this is a, the R usage from last year. So if you look at the month four, April, the interesting thing is to notice this gray bar. So the gray bar, if it's below the X axis, means we're exporting. So if you look, April, May and June, we didn't import any electricity. In July, when you actually, you'd expect to be <laughs> optimal for the, uh, for the solar, there was obviously a lot of dark days because we actually imported quite a bit in July as well as exporting. But then again, September, August, September, we didn't. It's all export. And it wasn't until we got to October, November, December that we started importing. So not only does it give us the resilience in terms of if there's a power outage, we'll be able to still operate all our TVs and computers and all those sort of things. But uh, you know, at the moment, you know, it's very, very efficient in terms of reducing our carbon because we're just, we're, we, we're either producing it or uh, storing it. The other thing was the extension. So you saw the picture of that little extension there. The extension was built uh, very poorly, but the previous owners, uh, I don't know. Anyway, single glazing, single uh, single skin of bricks, and a roof that wasn't insulated. And guess what? It got very, very hot in summer and very, very cold in winter. And their solution was to put a radiator there, which you just think is so crazy. So what we did was when we had our extension, we, we thought we want a bigger conservatory area than that. 
and we, we we did it in on sort of passive solar design so passive solar just means that you're just using the sun to provide the heat and energy and you don't you know no, there's no sort of mechanical means of heating so if you look at the insulation up here so one of those layers of those that Kingspan insulation would be what would be part L regulations at the moment we've got two there so it's actually getting much more insulated you then have uh, this the roof here you can see the, the depth of the roof so that's much deeper than normal so again it's very 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 well insulated these dark tiles act as absorbers so as sun comes in through the south facing windows they absorb heat but if it's very dull days or we've got lots of dull days we can actually also just close off this old area so you see these doors here these triple glazed doors we just can shut those and we just actually say okay we just abandon the conservatory and we we come inside so the only heated areas inside so again it's another sort of couple of principles uh, this is built by a friend of ours um, so he's an eco builder and it's just again at the time putting this extra insulation in wouldn't have cost that much more but in terms of the whole of life the carbon emissions is really good so a quick analysis we're aiming for one ton per person so what we're interested in the black bars so we're starting off at 3.5 tons you can go up to four tons and then we're ending up 2015 down at two so let's do some some further analysis so you think okay uh why so high in 2006 well one reason is flights again so we might have decided we weren't going to fly again but the problem is that uh, that was late on in 2006 i had already carried out six flights to europe <laughs> by then and um yeah so other things uh, we'll see as we go along so insulation goes in so if you look at the the blue the gas that goes down that's great so that's having some effect on the space eating also we haven't all got that um, that purple bar for the flights so that's good but our tons per person has gone down so this is another thing you've got to still bear in mind the reason for that is in 2000 we're a four person household in 2006, we were a 3,000 household. In 2007, our son went off to the States to study there. So we were a two-person household. So even though we started to make carbon reductions, our per person uh, load went up because of um, we uh, had an occupancy of two instead of three. So if you start to look at the effects of PV and solar, and you can see everything's going in the right direction. So wood burning stoves brings down a lot in the gas the pv and solar uh, brings down a lot in the electricity so generally by the time of 2015 you can see the electricity is you know it's a half a ton as opposed to two and a half tons the uh the let's go to the gas the gas is one and a half tons as opposed to four no flights and transport Transport is a really, really difficult thing for us because um, we depend on a car, like a lot of people. You know, if you've got sick parents in, in South Yorkshire and you need to travel there, you, you go there. You don't um, think about it. Uh, also, by not doing flights, that did mean things like sometimes you drive to a European holiday. So petrol travel still was going up. Nowhere near as bad as when we're having the flying. But then it occurred to me, what a brilliant idea. We could do the old offsetting trick. So what about all that electricity that we export? Let's offset it. So here's a graph showing that how is Grossmont after we've actually offset the electricity we export? Let's get a carbon credit for it, you know, a bit of cap and trading that you do in Europe. But even when we you know, do the little trick that of offsetting our carbon, we still don't make the one ton per person. So what we need to do is either take on board a lot lodger, but we're, what we're looking at next is we're looking at, um, well, we've actually got quotes for putting an air source heat pump. So once we put that in, we won't actually have any uh, gas emissions at all. So there will be electricity emissions, uh, carbon emissions because of electricity, but hopefully, well, not hopefully, what I've calculated is with the coefficient of performance you get of an air source heat pump, 
it's going to be a lot less than a gas boiler and a gas central heating system. So you know, other things we achieved, the energy rating of our house, so we the EPC, the EPC gives us an energy rating of B. I was looking in the estate agents, the, uh, and there's a house there in the six ways estate agents there, built in 2015 and only had an energy rating of C. And the four new houses that have been built just off Cudnell Street, just 100 metres from here, They've only got an energy rating of B, but you know, it's disgusting, really. New build should be able to be, should be getting an A, I think. But as I say, we haven't finished. I think we achieved a lot. And also then the next stage will be the SOS heat pump. So maybe I'll report back on that. So that's my uh, little talk about how we nearly achieved one ton per person. And so with that, I'll hand back to Felicity. Uh, thank you, Mike. Um, I can I say thank you? I was completely absorbed there and I've just suddenly looked at the questions and we've got one, but I think it's probably a case of um, others are uh, kind of thinking it through. Um, so I, I'll ask you the, the question that's here, but please, um, everybody, you know, put your questions in there. Um, I've got one or two as well, but I'll, um, I'll just ask. So when were the PV panels fitted and how often would they need to be replaced and serviced? Mike. Right. Well, the, uh, the the PV panels were put in in uh, 2008 and uh, 2013. So the lifetime of them, uh, when we put them in in 2008, uh, the lifetime of them, well, it's, it's, they don't really know. I mean, it's probably indefinite, but the, what there is is a slight degradation over the period. So they degrade by sort of 1% a year or so. So the, I mean, again, as I'm doing this to reduce the carbon, when I put them in in 2008, the embedded carbon in a PV panel was 11 years. So for our altitude, we would have been running those PV panels for 11 years before we broke even on the carbon debt. So it's only from year 11 onwards that uh, would be any good. Now it, it's come down a lot because now they, when they manufacture the PV panels, there's not so much embedded carbon in there. But so it's just terms of how long do they last? So yeah, we've had ours since 2008 and there hasn't been any problems. We have had an inverter replaced during that time. So the way things work is that your PV panel produces direct current. Your, your household uses alternating current. So it goes through a, a device called an inverter which changes that direct current to, in, to an alternating current. So we've had an inverter pack up. So inverters get, um, you know, have a warranty of 10 years to 20 years, depending on the manufacturer. So, uh, but the panels, there's actually no sort of moving parts or anything. So generally they just keep on working and working, but they just, will, they, they'll just they start to lose their efficiency. We'll see. Thank yeah. you. Um, so we have one here. How has the decarbonisation of the UK electricity grid as a whole impacted your electricity carbon footprint? Massively. So, you know, I told you when we started off, the electricity was, uh, the emissions were three times that of um, gas per kilowatt hour. So, you know, basically now, I'm just trying to look at the, uh, the exact figures. Uh, but I, I think it's... The, the, so basically, they've reduced 57% since I started doing it. So 57% of the carbon emissions has reduced. So because, you know, before, in the early days, it was a no-brainer to actually burn gas because it's, it's a third the price and a third the emissions. But now it's, it's getting closer to parity. The problem is it will never will achieve parity uh, whilst you have gas-fired power stations. You know, because obviously, once you've got a gas-fired power station, there's an efficiency there because there's all the energy that escapes from burning the gas to produce the electricity, and there's the inefficiency in transforming it to high voltage and transporting it large distances. Okay. Um, I've got uh, one slightly different, but do you run an EV, and have you looked at charging from your Tesla battery? Um, I think that's what they're really designed for. Uh, we, we actually had ordinary lead-acid um, uh, batteries there before we had the Tesla and if you sort of see it is I think the idea is people put their Tesla power wall on the outside of their American house and use that to charge their EV or the Tesla <laughs> yeah but uh, we I mean we we 
we've moved from the um, the original lead acid batteries because the when the inverter packed up that is the inverter that that was the only inverter we could use to use um, our battery system and the dutch company uh, packed up so we had to go for this tesla system who still wanted a battery backup system right okay Oh, we didn't have to, but we could have, yeah, but we decided that we would use the Tesla batteries at the time. I mean, one of the things, sorry, I'm going to uh, just go our questions, but one of the things that strikes me is there's a, uh, several things. Some of it that you had a, a background in some of this, but also the, the and, you know, the financial support to do it, because some of these things are quite expensive to kick off. Is there anything yeah, they, that you could have chosen that, you know, could you know not say it was inexpensive but was was would you have invested in if your funds had been absolutely limited um no i think we made the commitment to actually use because the fact we were quite cash rich so we a lot of the things we did um probably wouldn't make sense unless you actually just were driven to do it because the at the time we put in our pv because we were early adapters we didn't get feed in tariffs or anything like that the cost of that system was about 25,000, whereas now that'll probably be reduced to about 10,000 or something like that. Right. So, um, no, I don't, I don't think so. I mean, but I, I'm fully aware that people, yeah, not everyone can afford it. So it's a question of, you know, how you think you can, you can, mm. your own personal way you can contribute to um, helping the, uh, the battle against climate change. I mean, it could be just writing letters to Alex every week. So we don't want a coal mine in um, in the, the Cumbria. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. No, but I mean, as as we know, one of the reasons why Charlton Kings is coming out quite high in its carbon mm. footprint is because people are, tend to be more affluent here. So there's a view yeah. that you know that people with yeah. more money spend, you know, um, yeah. more carbon I mean, that's yeah. There's lots of things you see. I mean, one of the you see. So you know, I, I was in the software house there as a project manager, putting in multi-million pound systems in insurance companies and building societies, things like that. And then I moved to this um, sustainability charity or two. And one of the things I was doing was to be giving energy advice. And so I'd go around to places like uh, Fossway Living and Seven Vale Houses to give energy advice to sort of help these people to, uh, in energy poverty. And you, you come away and you look at the bills and thinking, the carbon emissions are nil. They're not switching on the heating. <laughs> you know, there, there were people, you get the situation where, you know, their only heating was storage heaters because they're off grid and they couldn't afford it. And so you look at the bills and you're thinking, right, yeah, your carbon footprint is really, really low. And yet we do know, I mean, yes, you're saying carbon footprint in John Kings will be high because yes, there undoubtedly will be areas of, of, of poverty, but there's a lot, a lot of rich people here. I mean, the mm. people will have two, three, four cars. And even if they're not running them, the embedded carbon in those cars, I mean, yeah. You tend to suspect that people have two or three, four cars because when it's a very sunny day, you notice a lot of cars with an open top. And I think that must be just their summer car, you know, because. <laughs> but when they're not using that, that's sitting on the driveway and it's got embedded carbon in it. So, yeah, I don't know. Actually, I don't really know what I've, sorry, I've wandered there. Sorry for listening. <laughs> that's my fault. I asked you a question. Um, so, um, uh, one here. Um, you have obviously a software background and like spreadsheets, absolutely. But how would others measure and monitor their carbon footprint on a yearly or daily basis? Um, as I say, there are lots and lots of tools out there. So when I was starting off, uh, because of my slight sort of anal retentiveness, that I did record everything on spreadsheets. I used to like to know what my costs were per month and so on. So it's quite easy for me to then take all that information and actually convert that to what the carbon footprint was. There are lots of tools there now if you want to do it. So, so you know, things like uh, the way the you, energy statements are produced now, you should be towed or the kilo hours you use for gas and electricity in a year. So that's all very easily measurable. The amount you do on your car, um, you can do good approximations in terms of things like you know, your annual mileage from MOTs or whatever. Uh, there's the simple tool that um, people in Tom King's Futures were discussing was the World Wide Life Fund one, which is a very simple one. You know, and that, because it's, it's, I would suggest you start off with that one. And then if you do want to get a more accurate footprint, then you start to move on to these other things. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, obviously, you know, it is very, very difficult because it's almost as if you, 
you've got to try and understand every single thing like food you know, if you grow it yourself that's obviously very low carb but then if you start taking food you've got to work out is this okay has this come from food that's been is this meat being produced by soya that's been grown in an area that's cleared in amazonia and so all that sort of thing that's really really tortuous and i would just um you know i think the idea is just learning certain principles and not so worry about the, the, the carbon footprints if you do want to know you're making a difference it is useful to have that but then keep it to the i would keep it to the simple things that you can actually see objectively and very easily measurable as opposed to the more difficult things to measure yeah, I think it's good. Uh, yeah, the advice on principles, particularly. I mean, it always reminds me a lot like Weight Watchers in a sense. You know, you you instinctively you do know where whether you you know you're making a change, even if you know it's um, a you know pair of jeans or something that fits better. There is something that you know. You know if you want to be you know vegetarian or vegan, or you're driving in you know a different car or not a diesel or something, or you're walking instead of taking the car. You will know yourself so you don't in a sense need to measure it quite as much um the, uh other questions will you need to change your radiators to underfloor heating to get the most out of the air source <clears throat> heat pump now to get the most out of an air source heat pump is you, you start from when you build a house because what you would want is the super insulated floors and underfloor heating because that's the best for a sort of low temperature uh, space heating systems what you'll do is what they'll do here in grossmont and what they've, um, the, the estimates come in for is they actually have to increase the size of the radiators. So you just think about it, it's quite logical. A gas is working, a bus is pumping around really hot water. So these um, radiators can give out a certain amount of energy. Uh, but when you give in the lower temperatures, you've got to have bigger areas to get out the same amount of energy into the room. So, so it gives the comfort level you want. Other things will be slightly different is that the way gas works is that you can actually have a, a controller there which say okay it doesn't matter during the day if we're energy efficient because all the heat can escape but then we'll get the house up to temperature by using our programmer to set it half an hour before we come back home from work and that everything will be behind with the lower um, heat systems for air source heat pumps you probably would have to have them on longer um so you know, the, the way the estimates that's come out for um, ours is that we would. I've forgotten, Vicky. Can you tell me what's the size of the air source heat pump? Never mind. It, it's, it's, it's not that big, but it's not as good as, for instance, um, someone we know has got a passive house. I so think it's about 3.1, was it? Something like that. I can't remember. I can't remember. Sorry. Yeah. But the, the, the so I can, what I can tell you is that somebody in um, the other side of Cheltenham, his passive house, it's a four bedroom detached house and he has a, a 1500 watt air source heat pump and i just sort of equate that to when i was a student and you had a kilowatt bar electric fire and you didn't switch on the second bar that was too expensive that would have been two kilowatts so but he is actually heating a whole four bedroom detached house with 1500 watts of energy and you know you sort of think oh, that's just amazing yeah yeah, um, I'm, I'm going to ask you a related question. How much does an air source heat pump uh, system cost? <clears throat> the, the major cost will probably be something, someone like Cheltenham, so uh, for Grossmont as a retrofit, is will be all the change of the uh, radiators and the plumbing. So the what you've got is the, the central heating here is a mix of sort of um, micro bore and normal gauge tubing and the radiators will be sized for a real hot water system. The estimates that the cave we got from Shackleton, Wintel and uh, other companies it was about £14,000. So you can see, again, it's a very expensive thing, you know, because you consider if you just went in there and got a replacement gas boiler, uh, you know, it'd be a couple of thousand or... But, yeah. uh, so it is a very, very major cost. Absolutely. Um how do you convince others who say that global warming is not a real thing um i i don't so you know because one of the things has been that we, yeah. when i did work for seven wire agency i'd actually go up beyond the street there trying to persuade people to get insulation and take low energy light bulbs and things like that and occasionally you'll get climate change deniers would come up to me and i sort of thought oh, you don't understand look let me explain something to you 
And then I realized, I don't understand. You can't explain that. So, and, and I thought, well, I don't see any point because at the time there's so many people who did want to do something. Why spend trying to, time trying to convince somebody who wasn't gonna be convinced? And I think, you know, that was my experience when I was on the street, um, you know, sort of 2008, nine and 10. Now I think it's far worse because now, because of the concentration power of the social networks is that climate change denial isn't amongst a few um, economic supporters of von Hayek and, and uh, Friedman. This is actually now really widespread amongst the conspiracists. And so, you know, it's the same sort of thing you get is you, you, the anti-vaxxers and so on. I mean, I, I've got an interesting book here with all these uh, with the academics sort of oh. suggesting how do you persuade people about not just about climate change, but about other things about um, that the, the earth isn't flat or that you know, people landed on the moon or you know, that the Democratic Party isn't um, a paedophile gang or whatever. And the, the conclusion is very depressing because it seems to be that you can't, there's no, it doesn't matter what evidence and so on, they're not going to believe it because I'll be just more convincing. Oh, that's, that's because the deep straight is, is really going to convince me against it. So when you say, I don't know why the person asked that, I don't know if you've come across people who actually are climate change deniers. Uh, I just, I, I've, I've never had the need and I just don't see the point in trying to talk to somebody who you won't convince. And there are lots of people who who who, who are just crying out to say, oh, how can I help? How can I do something? So, you know, connect with them rather than, you know, trying to achieve the, you know, as far as I'm concerned, unachievable. Yeah, uh, yeah, and I, th I think I would agree from what we've we've picked up. Um, there was one question. We're gonna. I'll um, just ask this one. And uh, is, are there any studies on the different carbon emissions for homes not made from bricks and, and mortar? Um, so, I think what we're talking about is probably a, a mobile home or something like that. Um, there are. Um... In fact, there's, there's always everything is out there. So the in the early days when I used to be doing the research on this sort of thing, the uh, Bath University used to have a, a database of all the various um, building materials you can have. So, you know, you compare sort of things like concrete to hempcrete and whatever. And also they do have sort of these these ideas about saying, OK, here's what here's what's involved in a, a pre-packed eco home. And um, yeah, so there are stuff out there. Uh, I, I don't really know. Um, yeah, because yes, so you you uh, if, so with a bit about sort of made from bricks and mortar. Yes, you'll have all sorts of things uh, as to the best um, choice of materials that will need to be uh, to, to build. Because obviously, something like cement is a, is a really big, big um, carbon emitter. So it's something we've really got to get sorted out. Um, I, I oh, um, I think there's just yeah, there's one more that's come in. Um, uh, right. <laughs> Um, I've just been asked, um, oh, hang on, sorry, it just jumped away. I've been asked why 250 trees were planted on Newcourt Green. Um, it's, I, I think, yeah, um, I don't know if you, we've, we've got an answer to that one, really. Um, no, I don't know. It's just people like trees or people don't like trees as well. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but I don't know where Newcourt Green is. Uh, is that? It's uh, we're near the Sainsbury's, the little Sainsbury's mm. on Sirencester Road. Yeah, I mean, I mean, there'll be sort of things. So people are saying, well, uh, I might sort of say, what sort of trees were planted there? And uh, you know, because the uh, permaculture principle is to obtain a yield. I say, oh, have you thought of planting fruit trees there? Oh, <laughs> but um, no, yeah, yeah. I, I, I'll be strongly thinking how to respond. Yeah, yeah. seems well, a good thing well, to me. That, because if they don't understand there's a climate emergency and planting trees is a good thing, mm. I'm really struggle to see how I'm going to have a sensible conversation. Right. So. Okay. Uh, well, th that's m nearly it. Um, I, interestingly, you've just reminded me of a conversation, a very passing conversation I had with somebody who's on this, and they were coming through Cox's Meadow and they saw some trees and said, exactly as you did, why don't we have fruit trees here and make it, you know, a community um, thing mm -hmm. to be able to grow fruit trees and pick your own. And I thought I, I, I've never kind of lost that moment. And I thought, actually, um, it reminds me of, of the um, Rob Hopkins book uh, for anybody who's um, reading it. I, I don't know if I've got a copy around here, but it's called What If? And, and I think that sometimes we, there's not enough what if around. We, we kind of stuck in a groove 
So it's great to not be stuck in that groove. I think what you've proved today is that um, you you heard something, it was powerful, you went home, you talked to your family and you worked together to, to do something really, you know, I mean, you, you the way you talked about just stopping those flights, you weren't just doing one or two, you were doing a lot. And that must have, you know, even though tonight you've just made it sound like, well, that was a straightforward thing to do. Actually, there must have been some quite deep thinking about, well, what does that impact? How does, how do we live? How are we going to manage? Because you weren't doing six, eight flights in a few months just because, you know, you wanted to. There must have been some other reasons as well around work and everything. Um, so, no, I also, mainly because I wanted to. I, well, I like going to places like Barcelona and Rome, and you know, and I like cheap flights. You know, I was, I, honestly, I was, I was a carbon tart. I just that was the reason. <laughs> okay. Well, can I just say thank you, Mike? That was okay. excellent, um, and thank you to everybody for coming tonight. Um, I hope I, I certainly took a lot from it. I uh, the trouble with this, I'm sure, with our working lives as well. Whether you're retired or uh, you know anybody who's on this, you're not. You're still working, but you don't have time to stop and reflect and have you know um, somebody just talking you through some of this great stuff. As I said before, Mike, there's a whole load of stuff that Mike hasn't talked to us about. So if if anybody is interested, I might persuade him to come back later in the year and talk about bees and 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 growing and all the other things that he talked about in his his summary um the um i will send a follow-up email with some questions about tonight it helps us with feedback for the next event i did mention um rachel kelly who's joining us on the 28th of april um and she's going to talk about uh, climate change and it, that will come out and it'll be advertised and it'll be open to the public so again um it was great uh, there was there was 21 people here tonight so that's fantastic so thank you so much for supporting this this has made a real difference it's been trouble uh, people so nothing from it but that's all that's all that matters Great. Yeah, your feedback is really appreciated. So thank you all again. And thank you for all your help making this happen. It's been 16 months we've been doing this. This is a real seminal moment. So, okay. Good night, thank everybody. You.